Zahari Ahmad Shah, MH370, suspicious flight simulator data, major premeditation, the plane which disappeared just in front of everyone. There are a lot of channels out there that have made brilliant walkthroughs of what most likely took place on that fateful night of March 8, 2014. Instead, today we'll try to answer the question that kept appearing in my head over and over again as I watched one documentary after another. Why was the MH370 the final choice for Captain Zahari? Why MH370? If he had chosen another flight, as he initially planned, it would have been much easier to put the plan into action. Fascinatingly enough, now it's no matter how much effort he did put in, because with the help of the weak signal propagation reporter system, known as Whisper, it was possible to determine the exact route of the vanished plane, but how have they done it? We will also discuss in this video. Today it is widely considered that MH370 was hijacked by the pilot in command, Zahari Ahmad Shah. His home fly simulator shows us a lot of premeditation, however waypoints found in the log files provide more questions than answers. Did he expect a bigger fuel quantity? Was his actual plan to go to the South Pole? Did the Royal Malaysian Police try to cover up incriminating flight simulator data? Why are Zahari's flight simulator waypoints inconsistent with MH370's flight path? We can only speculate. Captain Zahari had two hard drives in his computer. The main one had FSX installed, while the other one had Flight Simulator 2004. The 777 lr model was available only for the older version, so it was used for all of his disappearance rehearsals. Zahari's user waypoint suggests that the Mark Murder Research Station in Antarctica was used to create the southbound deviation path. A flight simulation session was initiated on February 2nd, two days before Zahari was supposed to take command on the flight MH150 headed to Jeddah, and his simulated flight path suggests possible intentions to hijack it. The flight session had a duration of 72 minutes, during which the captain of the vanished Boeing was manually positioning the plane along the virtual points, changing the amount of fuel on board. At the takeoff roll, the fuel quantity was almost identical to that on MH150, communicating one massive warning sign to the investigators. Due to the bigger block time needed for Jeddah, his expected coordinates of fuel exhaustion were farther south from the believed area of the MH370 crash. After ending his flight with a crash in the Indian Ocean, Zahari deleted Flight Simulator 2004 and went to fly the MH150 headed to Jeddah just in two days. When it comes to the full flight simulator data, everything becomes very complicated. It looks like the Royal Malaysian Police weren't given the full picture here. All they have are seven files with some of the waypoints, which they say most likely were from different sessions. The Australian Transportation Safety Board, on the other hand, seems to have all the necessary information but isn't willing to disclose it fully. However, ATSB provides some guidance to independent researchers, giving them what they want bit by bit. Here's what researchers could get from ATSB. Right at the beginning, Zahari probably the gate programs the flight management computer, where he enters all the official lane waypoints of the recovered flight plan. He takes off and proceeds towards Vampy. At point 5 November, he pauses the flight and adds enough fuel to get from point 10 November to the magnetic south pole. When the captain reaches Vampy, he starts the southbound turn. Next, the plane is moved straight to the point 10 November, where the pilot finishes the turn to 180 magnetic compass degrees and starts jettisoning the fuel. At this point, Solen, fuel ends. After it happens, Zahari drags the plane deep into the southern Indian Ocean and leaves the simulator on that note. This raises the question, why was the MH150 never hijacked? We can clearly see that Zahari was actively planning to go missing on the first try, but something went wrong then, and I think only one thing saved the flight to Jeddah. And it's the thing that didn't depend on Zahari. The 9-hour flight required two sets of crews present on the plane, and with them it would be considerably riskier to pull the disappearance off. It is possible that Zahari wouldn't even end up at the controls in time to turn where he planned. 
At this point, it is important to discuss the two ways of distributing the pilot's workload during long-haul operations. In Malaysia, the flight is considered long-haul if the block time exceeds the 7-hour limit. In both cases, every pilot must be present in the cockpit during takeoff, landing, climbing out and the final approach, but when the plane is cruising, things change. The first way implies that during the middle of the flight, the relief pilots, or one pilot depending on the flight time, start the flight duty period, which ends when the plane is at the gate. For the second and more common way, relief pilots are active only during the cruise section of the flight, where they look after the plane while the first set of pilots are resting. If on that day the crew rotation was performed in the second way, Zahari wouldn't even be present inside the cockpit at the planned deviation time. The disappearance was planned a solid 847 nautical miles down the flight plan route, way after the start of his rest time. But still, all this is pure speculation. Unfortunately, with all that Zahari planned and didn't implement, the MH370 has successfully gone missing. For years, the aviation community only had to make guesses about where exactly the debris of that 777 lay. And all that was until an avionics mechanic, Richard Godfrey, and his colleagues decided to use the radio signals to determine the exact position of a crash site. When a radio ray goes through a hard object, it changes the frequency by a bit. And if we know the exact locations of the source of the signal and its receiver, we can find the exact location where the frequency drift occurred. And here the whisper technology comes in. Weak Signal Propagation Reporters is a network of radio enthusiasts who both transmit and receive weak signals of different origins. Every two minutes the whisper system makes a scan of itself, noting every successful transmission. There are thousands. The best thing is that it saves the data into an archive, which dates back to 2008. Richard Godfrey and colleagues analyzed all the transmissions that took place as the plane was flying and presented their understanding of the MH370's flight path, which aligns perfectly with all known radar data as well as with all the Inmarsat arcs. This is a huge breakthrough for the search mission because now we are presented with a new search area which is only 1370 square kilometers compared with 4.5 million previously searched. Even plane debris found in Africa could be traced to this new location which still wasn't searched. There is a better explanation of Whisper's flight path made by Mentor Pilot, I will leave a link to it in the description. We already know so much about possible location of the MH370 crash site, yet the searches were suspended. With all new information that is available to the public, it is fully possible to find the wreckage. We only need to restart the search. With the help of dozen various articles, I could recreate the flight simulator path of Zahari Ahmad Shah. If you want to check out other video where I search for the exact location, you can watch my Aviation Geogesser series. But for now, have a good flight without squawking 7500.